Painting and Travel's next destination, the Wooden Boat School in Brooklyn, Maine. We'll follow Sarah as she learns about the art of boat building, and Roger will set up his easel and use acrylics to paint along the rocky shore. Today, Sarah and I are in Brooklyn, Maine, home of the well-renowned Wooden Boat School. I'm down here on the beach. That's the dock for the Wooden Boat School. Wooden Boat School's up here, but I've chosen to be here. It's just a lovely little scene. It's very overcast today, so we have what we call flat light, not getting any highlights on anything, but actually it's a relief sometimes standing out in the bright sun. It's pretty brutal, so I'm welcoming this nice overcast. I'll get started. I'm using acrylics today. I'm using a masonite board, and I use masonite boards. This is eighth inch masonite, primed in gesso, with a little bit of burnt sienna wash on here. I like to use the masonite simply because as we travel, it's very thin, we can carry it, doesn't take up much space at all. So that's one good reason for using masonite while painting outside. But I really like the feel of the masonite, I've gotten used to it, so uh, let's get started. I'm only using three colors today. It's titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, and alizarin crimson. I usually start out with my dark colors first. Well, I think I'll start by just mixing up my three colors here to make a dark color, maybe a little more blue in there than anything else. And I'll uh, just sketch out very roughly my composition. If I wasn't really sure of what I was going to do. I might want to sketch this out in charcoal, but I've been standing here for a while and I have a pretty good idea of what I want to paint. I intentionally put my easel on this side of these uh, the seaweed that's washed up on the beach because this will give me a nice little curve past me here. If I were on the other side of the seaweed, then this that seaweed line would run about into here, not give me this nice graceful line flowing out this way. This composition here almost divides the subject into thirds, not quite, but at least I've got the horizon line up here. I just wouldn't want to put the horizon line in the center of the painting because equal parts of a painting are a little less interesting than having unequal parts. So that's one reason I'm putting the horizon up here. And of course, the other reason is that most of the interest of my subject is down here. This, especially today, this is not a painting about the sky because it's pretty bland sky. So this is a chance to really focus on these rocks down here in the tide. It's a big tide in uh, Maine right here, 10 or 12 feet, water comes up and down. So uh, later on in the day, we would be standing in water here. You know, we've got this sweeping line that comes right around here. That's that seaweed. And this might lead my eye right back into the pier over there. That's kind of my hope. In the background, there's lobster boats. They come out early in the morning and pull up their lobster traps so we can hear them with their big diesel engines out here in the bay. I think that's all I need for the drawing on this. And uh, I'm going to prepare this a little bit more, and I think now's a good time to join Sarah as she meets the director of this beautiful boat school, and we'll learn a little bit more about the school and its history. This is Rich Hillsinger, and he's the director of the Wooden Boat School here in Maine. And we're on the porch of one of the buildings where they hold a class. As director, you've been here over 30 years, and um, you have lots to say about the school. Yeah, well first, welcome. Thank you. It's, it's nice to have you here. Um, we've been, uh, this is our 32nd year of operation. Um, and uh, these days it's, well for a number of years now, it's a pretty extensive program. When we first started back in 1981, we only offered uh, perhaps two dozen courses uh, on a variety of boat building 
uh, techniques and so on and so forth. And over the years, it has evolved into a pretty extensive program where we're offering each year close to 100 different courses on boat building techniques, uh, repairs, designs, uh, classes that you can come and build your own boat in a week and take it home. And what age does this appeal to? Uh, the minimum age is usually 16, although we will make exceptions sometimes depending on the individual. And we've had folks here well into their 90s, folks from all over the world. Uh, it attracts people who uh, are into boat building, perhaps as a hobby. Some people who want to get into the industry uh, as an occupation. So some of the people come here to get a taste of what boat building is all about. There's always been a romanticism about wooden boats and so on and so forth. Well, before you invest your time and your money into a long-term program, you can come here and see if it's what you thought it was going to be. If you enjoy it, then we refer you to uh, other schools in the country that are that are geared toward the industry. Then they will place their graduates in the industry. Tell me about some of the different styles of boats you can produce here. Yeah, we tend to build things 25 feet and smaller simply because our program is set up in one week and two week blocks of time. So if I come as a student, you've already got the materials here for me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and again, there's a whole range of boat building classes. There are ones that are geared for the beginner. There's others that are geared for people who have some sort of boat building experience. And then there's other ones that cater to people who are, are already have a pretty good grasp of boat building and we're building designs that are a bit more complex. Uh, there's also a whole series of courses where you can come say with family members or friends and family and build, it's a kit boat in a sense, but you can build your own kayak or canoe or some type of small day sailor in a week and at the end of the week take it home. And so a family could come uh, and, and put their boat together and then uh, continue their vacation. Yes. <laughs> and the reputation of the school is known around the world. Yes. When we first started, um, a number of people who came to participate in the program were aware of us through Wooden Boat Magazine. And we here at the school, Wooden Boat is school is a department within Wooden Boat Publications. And that originated with the founding of Wooden Boat Magazine, which is a bi-monthly magazine that goes out to over 100,000 subscribers around the world. Um, the school is uh, what you read about within the pages of Wooden Boat Magazine. It comes to life here on this campus. The, a lot of people ask me, so what do you think the future of Wooden Boat is? Do you think it's just going to, you know, fade away? And I don't think so. I think it's important for us as people to always use our hands, especially in this day and age when we are having more and more things done by computers. I think for our own sanity, whether it's learning how to build an Adirondack chair, or whether it's pottery or stained glass or knitting or boat building, it brings a satisfaction to the individual, I made this myself, that you just can't beat. And I think as a species, I think that's really important to our survival and our, and our mental well-being. This is such a fabulous place to be, and uh, we have enjoyed our time here. As you saw, it's just a, a great place to come and visit. And this is also, of course, the home, like they said, of the uh, Wooden Boat Magazine, which I've really admired for years. So it's very special for us to be here. I'm putting in my dark colors, and I'll establish all these darks first. I'll lose my drawing as I do this, of course, but I just established that. I've got it up in my head where I want things to go pretty well, but painting is always about making changes all the time as I go. Painting is not like cooking. It's, there's no recipe for painting. So each time artists get out and paint, it's a whole different dish, you know? It's just, it's never the same. It's not a matter of a couple pinches of salt or a couple pinches of burnt sienna or some color. It's, it's always a totally new dish, you know, a whole totally new experience. Well, it's starting to rain just a little bit. I don't think that's going to bother me. It's been raining like this on and off all morning. 
These are acrylics, but you know, they dry so quickly that uh, that's not going to bother me either, unless we really get sort of a downpour here. Well, I've got my darks established. My middle tones are established already because this burnt sienna is really a middle tone. It's not the color I want, but it's the tone. So right now I'm trying to put in the tones, not worrying about the color. Since we have a gray sky, I'll mix some ultramarine blue and pick up my other two colors here, but I'll use more blue than anything. This might not be a bad time actually to use some black, but I don't think I will. Black might speed up the process here just a little bit by giving me the ability to make a nice gray. And I wouldn't make that gray just with black and white. I'd always mix other colors in it, but uh, I can really do the same here with just my three primary colors. I'm not using three colors just to be clever or anything like that. I really enjoy using a limited palette, but there are other times when I put out lots more colors. I was painting the other day right near the Owl's Head Lighthouse, just south of here, and I put out a number of colors. So I enjoy mixing it up, mixing it up some. We'll work on those negative areas a little bit later on. Acrylics don't cover as well as oils, if you've noticed, especially on the sky, where these areas on the sky. I'm trying to put some thick paint on here so I don't have to go back and paint it again. Now, it's, I've got it pretty gray. I think maybe that's a little bit too dark, but there are some patches of some warm clouds, some warm light up there. So I'll mix up some warmer color and drop it in there. Now, down towards the horizon here, it gets much warmer appears to me to be very yellowish. But when you get into these gray areas of color, um, it's very hard to tell exactly what color it is. And the color really depends on the colors next to it and the colors around it. The whole sky is a cool color. But compared to other parts of the sky, some parts of the sky are warmer than other parts of the sky. So that's why I keep saying this is warm and this is cool. Overall, it's cool. But compared to this cool here is warmer than compared to this cool blue here. I think this could change rapidly in the next 20 minutes or so. I'm sure it will. But I think that's probably a good basis to start from right there. I think I will sketch in very quickly the, the dock right out here. I'm going to put this dock in lower than I actually see it. It runs right on this tree line here. but. I'm going to pretend I'm up higher simply so I can get the tree line and this dock on a different plane. They won't run together. So this is just a compositional decision here. The docks up here, many of them have these massive granite piers underneath them. I'm going to leave some space here, even though I can't see any, but this will give me an opportunity to put some reflection down here. I was standing on the pier earlier and there's a patch of green we can see right over here but from the pier I see a lot more of it it was just beautiful rich green so I'm going to add more of that green in here than I see. I use the scene here really as a, a starting point as a takeoff point I don't have to feel like I need to reproduce it exactly. What I want to end up with, with is a, a nice painting, it, and uh, it, whether it's accurate or not, to the degree that there's more grass here or seaweed here, that's really irrelevant. Nobody's going to come down and compare. Mix up some more sky color it's for the water. This water appears to be lighter. And I think it's because there's just so much light coming down from up above, it is making this water lighter. This color here does not reflect anything about the sky. I'm never afraid to change what I've put on because I don't have much investment in time in putting this on, so I don't have much investment to change it to where I think it's right. The railings up here on the dock, I'm going to put those in later on, as well as the gangplank down here and a few boats. Here's the reflections from those heavy granite piers. 
And even though the water is very calm this morning, very still, there's always motion on the water, almost always. So we'll put a little soft edge on these. And here's another instance where I can't see the edge of this pier right here, these granite blocks, but I'm going to indicate a little water behind there just so I can define the three piers. I'd rather have these three piers defined rather than two. Two again is sort of a, it's an even number, it's not as interesting as three, so the three piers de defined here will help the composition. Still I'm working with values more than anything here. I haven't really gotten into too much color. Now the seaweed out here is a beautiful yellowish ochre color. So I'm going to lay in a darker color now, this reddish warm color. But over that, when that dries, I'll put that, I'll try and mix that, that yellowish color. I try and use as big a brush as I can when I'm painting to get the big areas in. If I use a small brush, I tend to get hung up in too many details that don't really add that much to, to my painting. So I try and block in as much as possible with a bigger brush. And then I can go back later and put in details if I, if I want to. But often it, it turns out that I don't need any more details than what sort of naturally occurs with a bigger brush, especially if you use the brush sort of roughly, you know, use it move it around in all different angles, and it kind of often gives a nice texture and indication of, of plant life. If I can create the same result with one or two strokes as I could with 10 or 12 strokes, I'd rather use the one or two strokes in my painting. It gives a more powerful feel to the painting, and uh, I think it gives more of a signature of the artist in the work. I'm not quite sure how to handle these rocks here, I'm just gonna have to feel my way into it, I think. I mixed some white with this warm color up here, and of course that makes it opaque. And when I do that, I lose all this beautiful texture underneath here, because this opaque, whenever I mix something with white, then uh, it will cover completely and I'll lose that texture. So I'm going to lose some of it, and I'm going to save some of that, and I can always go back over this with some transparent paints and add some texture too. Now if I were doing this painting in the studio, I would probably handle it totally differently than I am here in the field because I have a limited amount of time. Uh, I need to suggest things here rather than go into lots of little detail. So I'm going to, only going to suggest these rocks and if I'm lucky, I'll suggest just enough of them to give the impression that this is a, a rocky beach. So one way of doing that is to feature several of the rocks, leave these others just as total suggestions. I'm not thinking really about where I'm putting these. It's all feelings, you know? It's all got to do with how this feels. And my, as my brush dances around on this board, then my eye says, that's good, that's not, move these here, move them here, more here, less here. It's easy to overdo these paintings too. I don't like this angle coming in. This is quite far away, so this angle, I think, should flatten out because it's getting back there towards the horizon a little bit. So I'm either going to put some more water in here or bring this land down. I think I'll put more water. Ultramarine blue, lizard and crimson touch of yellow. That'll give me that very dark color. Maybe a little more lizard and crimson. This seaweed is very warm in color. Well, it's time I address these large trees up top. I think I'll take that same combination of colors, just add a little more yellow to it here. I'm going to spray this with my atomizer. That will let this paint flow over this already dry paint very quickly and easily. Now as I squint my eyes, the a light part of the beach is right up here. 
because the uh, tide doesn't come up, so no algae and seaweed and things grow on that part of it quite as much. Instead of holding my brush like this, I hold it sometimes like this on the side. It gives me a, a, a much looser attitude as far as the way the paint gets applied when I hold the brush like that. With the small dry brush, which means it's just paint's not very wet on it, I'm going to go back here in the distance and add these trees here to give them more description. Part of these piers are catching the light. They're a very warm color. Of course, anything that's catching the light with the sun is going to be warmer than things in the shadows. I think the tide has gone out considerably since I started just a few minutes ago. Since it's such a high tide, it comes in and out. It rises and falls very quickly. Of course, there's some large boulders up here on the shore. I think they will add a, another dimension to the painting. I'm lucky enough to have a nice natural S-curve on this composition already built into me here on this scene. It just goes around here. First, I thought this was just going to lead my eye into here, but this is good because this just gives me another layer of, uh, of landscape to look at. Well, we've been fairly lucky with the weather, but it's starting to rain now. I want to get as much information as I can while I'm here on location. That's really the point of coming outside and painting outdoors, is to get as much of this real life information because I can see so many more colors out here in the field than inside the studio. I'm getting some paint, uh, getting some rain spattered on my board, but this is dry, so unless, if I leave that alone, it's not going to affect the painting. If I start to put brush strokes over this, this water is very liable to rejuvenate this paint, and I would pick it up and leave sort of a, a spot in there. But if I don't touch that, I think I'll be okay. Wow, this is just, this is just so much fun. Just looking at nature here and then just having the fun of interpreting it. I haven't dealt at all with these trees or the negative areas. I'm gonna just jump in and put a few little negative areas up here where these tree trunks are. What I'll try and do with these negative areas is to describe the trunk that goes around it in the branches. Now I was going to deal with that beautiful yellow color of the seaweed. And I'm using the uh, Indian yellow, which is a very warm yellow, as opposed to cadmium yellow, which is a cool yellow. But this is a very warm color down here. And again, with a dry brush, I'm going to just drag those colors here. This may be the first painting program that was done in the rain. What do you think? It's been so nice painting out here in this overcast. It's given me a whole different sort of outlook on, on things. I'm often tempted when I do a painting like this, this to add a patch of sunlight somewhere in the painting. Because that, that could happen, of course. The sun could come out and this parts of that could be very bright. But in this case, I, I think I may just leave this as a very overcast looking subject. This would be a, an opportunity to get out one more color, and that's cadmium yellow. And this is a, a cool yellow. I'll we'll just put a little bit of that there because these greens right up here on the shore, I guess it, it must be new growth or something, so it's very brilliant. So this will give me the color I couldn't get with this Indian yellow, although I'm, I'm going to mix some Indian yellow with it. Well, the rain has finally moved in a little bit more and I think has challenged us enough where we'll have to wrap it up. But I've got what I need here. We'll take it back into the studio now. That'll give me the opportunity to think about this some more and we'll finish it there. Well, as you can see, I'm back in the studio to put a few finishing touches on this piece. The trees in the distance were too dark, so I lightened them with a mix of cerulean blue and white to give them some distance, letting some of the existing color that was on there still show through. I added more texture to the edge of the trees along with additional light green colors because that entire area 
with the tree was too dark and I needed something more going on there. Next I worked on the pier and added the railings and some detail. With a lighter mix of cool color I placed a few of the sailboats in the harbor. I kept them pale to keep that distant feeling and added a few faint reflections of the masts. More branches were placed in the trees along with more negative areas of sky. I misted my board with a sprayer and added lighter colored rocks with yellow ochre and white, maybe a bit of cerulean blue. The mist kept the edge soft while I applied the highlights to the rocks. A dark green color was added to the already placed seaweed on the beach. Lighter greens were placed up here on the ridge and also on the beach where more seaweed might have been. Small pools of water helped to create more interest in the foreground where the tide was going out. The pools also gave me a chance to put some reflections of the rocks in that water. More rocks were added to the foreground beach with both light and dark values. The hint of two people on the pier added some human interest and I finished by indicating more light colored trunks and branches to the trees and shrubs. The Wooden Boat School in Brooklyn, Maine is full of creative energy. If you enjoy boat building, model making, or of course painting, Sarah and I both recommend it as a great destination. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.